Ladies and gentlemen, to your attention, please welcome to Jimmy at the Crossroads, episode 57. On this edition of the Crossroads, Jimmy Sagerberger will break down the two sides to the protests and chaos. And then later, he'll be joined by Phil Van Dorn to discuss stock market strategies. Stay tuned. It's episode 57 coming your way. And that, my friends, is how America was made great once again. Breaking at this hour, Jimmy Sengenberger is currently at the crossroads of politics and economics. Radio broadcaster master, now the celeb on the web. He's the smarty of the party. He's in cahoots with the grassroots. Jimmy at the Crossroads brings you thought-provoking commentary, hard-hitting interviews, original satire, and the best bumper music known to man. Jimmy at the Crossroads! Gonna talk money, gonna talk politics, we're for all generations, oh, what a great mix, I said. Gonna talk money, gonna talk politics, great for all generations, oh, what a great mix. I got Jimmy and the Crossroads, making sense out of nonsense. People want answers. They want to understand. They come to the crossroads and Jimmy gives them the plan. I said, gonna talk money. Gonna talk politics. Great for all generations. Oh, what a great place. I got Jimmy at the crossroads. Making sense out of nonsense. Come on, Jimmy, what you got?
Hello, my friends, and welcome to another edition of Jimmy at the Crossroads. I'm Jimmy Sangenberger, your host for the program, coming to you in partnership with the Washington Examiner on this Thursday, June 4th edition of the program. Such a pleasure and a privilege to be with you today. A day on which we have more jobs numbers, some confusing jobs information. We will break it down in the next segment and talk about some stock market strategies with Phil Van Dorn of Market Watch. Always enjoy a good conversation with Phil Van Dorn. Looking forward to chatting with him today here on Jimmy at the Crossroads. He is investing columnist and analyst at Market Watch. We will have a fun conversation as per usual with the columnist today. And that's what we're going to be focusing on in the next segment, abbreviated show today on the program that brings engaging, intelligent talk, saying style. Such a pleasure and a privilege to be with you today. If you have not done so already, please do subscribe to the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jimmy at the Crossroads. Also, Tweet at me, 24-7-365, at Sang Center. That's saying with an E, not an A, Center on Twitter. There's Nathan Matouche working the Matouche magic to put that back up on the screen. You can also watch the content and more on the Facebook page, Jimmy Sangenberger, media personality. That is facebook.com slash Jimmy Sangenberger Pro. And be sure to follow our friends and partners at the Washington Examiner on YouTube. Facebook, Twitter, and of course at WashingtonExaminer.com where you can get the great reporting and commentary that our friends have available there. Once again, pleasure and a privilege to be with you today. And I want to begin the program with some somber thoughts today. You know, we are, of course, in the midst of great tumult in American society today. It's difficult. It's challenging. The divisions are visceral. The lines, let's show a little bit of the rioting and the peaceful protests both that we have seen happen throughout the course of the past several days. We're now, I think, past a week of rioting that began in Minneapolis following legitimate and peaceful protests. And we have seen mostly peaceful and legitimate protests as far as what has been happening across the country. You are seeing some of the rioting right now that we have seen. Let's show some of the peaceful protesting as well. Because this is what we need to keep in mind is happening across the country and the world. That there are people who are peacefully protesting injustice and who want genuine change in the world. Now, we need to have a discussion about what that change means and what that change actually entails. But nevertheless, it's happening in terms of the protests. The civil unrest is in no way an exemplification of anything positive about America, nor is the civil unrest, the violent, yes, I use the word violent, activities going on across the country as far as property destruction and looting and burning. There's no excuse whatsoever for any of that. And as we've talked about on this program a number of times already, it must stop. And it particularly must stop, and I want to start with this side of everything that we have been seeing. Because not only are we losing property, it's being stolen or destroyed, burned to the ground, government buildings included, meaning taxpayer dollars have to spend money on that. Meaning businesses will have to forestall investments, hiring new workers, giving wages, wage increases forestall reopening as they're just finally able to start reopening. We talked about all of this yesterday. But we've also been seeing a number of deaths across the country. 
people who have died primarily because, not exclusively because, but primarily because of the rioters. Wikipedia and some other sources have been keeping tabs on those who have died from the civil unrest, the rioting that we've been seeing. Calvin Horton Jr. died on May 27th, shot during a protest. We got a 21 year old young man in Detroit, a young black man watching. As I recall, in his car, was killed. On May 30th, Oakland, Federal Protective Services Officer David Patrick Underwood was killed, shot outside a federal courthouse. Black man. On May 30th, St. Louis, man died after being dragged behind the wheels of a FedEx truck trailer that, according to police, was fleeing from a group of protesters. We have seen these types of situations where vehicles have been surrounded and they're trying to get out of there and they're scared. May 30th, Omaha, 22-year-old protester James Skurlock fatally shot outside of a bar by the owner of the bar, Excuse me, he was the owner of the bar, and there had been a scuffle with protesters, and things got out of hand. So, or excuse me, the shooter was the owner of the bar. And when the chaos erupted, he was trying to protect his property. He's not going to be charged because it was in self-defense. May 30th in Indianapolis, two people fatally shot in the vicinity of of the protests. June 1, Louisville, Kentucky, restauranteur David McCarty killed when the Louisville Metro Police and the Kentucky National Guard opened fire on a crowd of protesters. We will get to the police in a moment. Davenport, Iowa, Two people who had been peacefully protesting, as I understand it, were killed, including 22-year-old Italia Marie Kelly, whose sister made a terribly distraught video condemning the violence and what was happening, noting that her sister, the 22-year-old young black woman, had been protesting peacefully and then was killed by violent protesters, a.k.a rioters, not genuine protesters. Cicero, Illinois, two people fatally shot in an afternoon of unrest confirmed by Cicero police. Shots fired by outside agitators. And we know that agitators are a lot of the instigators of what we're seeing with the violence and unrest. St. Louis, June 2nd, 77-year-old, retired police captain, Captain David Dorn, another black man, was shot and killed by looters at a pawn shop. Reportedly, it was streamed live on Facebook Live. And then you had attackers and looters who had been killed as well, a handful of them. This is not just about looting. This is not just about property damage. This is not just about buildings being burned down that can be replaced, like lives can be replaced. Lives are being lost here. Most of the lives that have been lost in these violent uprisings, the civil unrest, have been innocents who either were peaceful protesters, trying to protect their property, business owners, and usually they were killed by rioters, agitators. That's the loss of life and black lives that matter among them. Anybody who is making excuses for this kind of behavior is fundamentally, I, I, I don't even have any words. Like Nicole Hannah-Jones from the New York Times, 
Let's play that. Cut one. On CBS. What she had to say in providing some sort of an excuse for these rioters. One, we, we need to be really careful with our language. Um, yes, it is disturbing to see property being destroyed. It is disturbing to see uh, people taking property from stores. But these are things. And violence is when an agent of the state kneels on a man's neck until all of the life is leached out of his body. Destroying property which can be replaced is not violence. And to put those things, uh, to use the exact same language to describe those two things, I think really um, it's, not, it's not moral to do that. So, yes, I, I... It's not moral to say that destroying property is violence when it is but also she is ignoring the lives that have been lost including black lives that matter young men and women because of these riots on the other hand there are two sides to what's happening in terms of legitimate complaints legitimate gripes legitimate assertions of inappropriate behavior this all began because George Floyd was murdered by police officers finally George Floyd his killers have been charged all four of them aiding and abetting second degree murder for three of the officers and second degree murder for Derek Chauvin the primary officer who killed George Floyd those were police officers using excessive force in a senseless act of violence. We have to be honest, too, about the way in which some of the police in this country have been handling these protests, including peaceful situations. For example, two young people, Messiah Young, Tanaya Pilgrim, we're both in a car together in Atlanta, Georgia. They weren't doing anything wrong or illegal. And yet, the police went to the car, tased them both, and in particular, Messiah had harm done to him. Take a listen to these two young people, both college students together on CNN, I believe, yesterday, telling their story. Um, I have multiple injuries um, all over my body. My uh, wrist is cracked. I have 20 stitches in my forearm. I have bruises all over my ribs. And I had a taser in my back for about eight hours. What do you mean you had a taser in your back for eight hours? You mean that um, what they shot, it, it stayed I, in there? Yes. Um, initially, some of them were removed, but I informed them that I still had a taser in my back, and it was not taken out of me until around 2 or 3 a.m., and I got tased at around 9, 9.30. Oh, my God. And do you remember being tased? When we look at that video, it looks as though you almost sort of lose control of your limbs. It looks as though you're kind of convulsing. What was it like in that moment? Yeah. It's probably one of the hardest moments that I've had to face in my life. Um, I just, I can't even fathom what happened. Uh, at this point, I'm just so far gone. It's like I'm trying to remove myself from that situation, but it's, it's really hard to uh, cope with. And I watched the video, and it is terrible what happened to those two young people in a car doing nothing wrong. Asheville, North Carolina. By the way, those officers have been penalized. Um, some have been, I think, removed from the force. Um, investigations underway. The Atlanta police have taken quick action, which is good because you need 
to take swift action for those police officers who are the bad apples, who are doing things they shouldn't do. Asheville, North Carolina. Local police officers destroyed a medical aid station in an outrageous instance of excessive force and inappropriate, unspeakable behavior on the part of some officers. Again, in these instances, they seem to be facing consequences, but there's a problem here that must be addressed, and I think this is what people are protesting, and that is in terms of how police are approaching these issues, how police are handling the peaceful side of these protests, not just the rioting and the looting and the burning. I know that they are putting their lives on the line, and I tremendously appreciate it. I'm a strong believer in the fact that the vast, vast majority of police officers are doing good work. Some have been walking with the marchers. I mean, there are tr some tremendous of stories across this country. But at the same time, we are seeing excessive force, the kind of excessive force that is being protested across the country by police officers. There are two sides to the chaos. Most of it, rioters, agitators, who are spurring on some of the aggressive behavior perhaps by police that doesn't excuse it. We need to get this thing under control. It is terrifying what we're seeing as far as the level of violence and discord. And, and we need to have our governments across the country take firm action to get this thing addressed. But that does not mean that anything of the excessive force is appropriate. It is not. It must be condemned, must be sussed out, must be penalized. And I'm glad to see most of these police forces seem to be taking action, certainly quicker, than what happened to George Floyd and to his killers in terms of how long it took for them to be charged and fired and these kinds of things. So let's keep in mind there are multiple aspects to this and we need the full picture and I wanted to offer that today. All right, we are overdue for a break. In a few minutes, we will be joined by Phil Van Dorn, investing columnist and analyst at Market Watch. We'll talk a little bit about these jobs numbers coming in, some recent stories dealing with stock market strategies and more. He is, again, investing columnist and analyst at Market Watch. You are watching Jimmy at the Crossroads. I'm Jimmy Sangenberger, coming to you in partnership with The Washington Examiner. America's politics are crazy. The culture is in flux. That's why we work hard to help you keep up more politics, more culture, and more access. We focus on the biggest stories of the day with some of the biggest names in politics and punditry. Go to our website, WashingtonExaminer.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Hi, Tom. Gee, you look terrible. I feel terrible. Achy, fevery, nauseous. Ooh, that's too bad. You know, you ought to... Chill, stuffiness, bloating. Yeah, you know... You... Scratchy, gassy, drippy. I know. Say, Tom, you should try Weraflu. Weraflu? <coughs> Weraflu is the only medication that actually takes your flu symptoms and hides them at various places inside your body so that by the time your body finds them all, your flu is gone. In the meantime, you're back to work. You were right, Ed. Wear a flu lets me ignore my flu symptoms and gets me back to work. Thanks. Yeah, and thanks for coming in and infecting the rest of the office. <laughs> come out, come out wherever you are with Wear a flu. Take as directed. And now. The further future adventures of Starship, Starship Winkler. Unbeknownst to the crew, an alien cyborg has been transported onto a remote area of the ship. Captain, sensors indicate an alien presence on the hollaback deck, and it's headed this way. What do we do? I'll get it. Hi, guys. Who 
monster party! Oh my god, what is it, Mulgrew? It's a cyborg, Captain. Cyborg, what is your name? It's Miley! Miley Cyborg? Yeah. I've seen these creatures before, Captain. She's liquid dynamite. What do you want, Miley Cyborg? I just want people to stop treating me as a child cyborg. And if they don't... They must be twerkinated. She's a twerkinator, Model T-2000. Look out! She's got a foam finger? Mulgrew, what's happening? I feel a sensation in my forbidden zone. Oh my! I can't stop twerking! Ooh, Captain got back. Well, how will the Winkler battle the Twerkinator? And will everyone need spinal realignment? Tune in next time when we hear... We need a plan! Gather the crew around! All right, everyone. Into a circle, Twerk. On Starship, Starship Winkler! We interrupt this program for a very important presidential message. I have a very important issue that I'd like to discuss with you, the people of America and the people of the United States as well. Traffic circles, traffic circles. These things are very communistic. Older people are terrified of traffic circles. I noticed this about 20 years ago when they came in. I said, this is no good. Our forefathers didn't fight in World War II to have traffic circles. They're very scary. It's, oh, let's all join hands and come into the circle like hippies. Wrong. You come to a four-way stop like a man and you take your territory, if you can handle it. If you can't, you get spit to the side and you're out. You lose. You're a loser. And that's what I wanted to make very clear at this time. Thank you very much for your attention. That's all. Go away. Breaking at this hour, Jimmy Singenberger is currently at the crossroads of politics and economics. Are you all right with being a shark maverick? Was it okay to team up with you? I'm good, man. We're a part. It's a partnership. We're like this, Jimmy. I, we got, I got you. I got Jimmy at the crossroads, making sense out of nonsense. And now, Crossroad fans, let's get back to your host of Jimmy at the Crossroads, Jimmy Sagenberger. Coming back on Jimmy at the Crossroads, I am Jimmy Sagenberger. Pleasure and a privilege to be with you as always. Tomorrow, by the way, pleased to be joined by... Dinesh D'Souza as part of our Free to Choose Friday focused on socialism and especially socialism and young people working on confirming a couple of other great guests for the special Free to Choose Friday edition of the show tomorrow. Do not miss it right here on either Facebook or YouTube in terms of the live broadcasts. YouTube.com slash Jimmy at the Crossroads. Please be sure to subscribe if you have not done so already. Also, on Facebook, Jimmy Sangenberger Media Personality, Facebook.com slash Jimmy Sangenberger Pro, and follow me on Twitter at Sang Center, Sang with an E, not an A, Center on Twitter. Like on Facebook and subscribe to the channel, please. And of course, follow our friends, partners at the Washington Examiner on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, and at WashingtonExaminer.com. So great to be with you with more engaging, intelligent talk. And you know, one thing that's so interesting is what we're seeing with jobs data from yesterday. ADP and Moody's Analytics put out their own private payroll numbers, and they were oddly positive in the sense of only 2.8 million jobs lost in May, that is to say versus an expected 9 million jobs lost. That was the anticipated number. That's why it's good, because it was only 2.8 million compared to 9 million anticipated. Well, Kevin Hassett, one of the senior economic advisors to the Trump administration, was on was Fox Business yesterday, and he was asked specifically about these numbers, and he was a little puzzled. Take a listen until we reopened. And, and the right. way to think about it, back of the envelope, Maria, is for every week that the economy is shut down, you lose about 2% of GDP, but not at an annual rate. 
Uh, and, and so if you shut down for a month, then that's about 8% of GDP, and then you multiply that by four to get what happens when they put out the GDP release to put it at an annual rate. And so we I shut see. down really, we shut down really hard for a month, but now we're starting to open up. And mm. I believe that it's going to be very, very possible. Again, if you look at it, the, the, we're not seeing a wave of bankruptcies. We're not seeing a wave of defaults because of the PPP loans and all the cash that we put in people's pockets. Yeah. And so that we can, we can turn this thing back on. And, and you know, whether we do or not is something that we're just going to have to wait and see the data. But again, this ADP report is a real positive sign. And it's such a positive yeah. sign that I really have to grab my pencil and go back to my desk and see what's going on. Because so, it's just, it's way lower than so I expected. A head scratcher, so positively lower. But then today, weekly jobless claims totaling 1.877 million last week versus a 1.775 million estimate. Total claims rising to 21.5 million, meaning we are slowly getting workers back to work. The stock market's down a little bit today, although it's been rising the past few days. What are the dynamics at play? What are investors keeping in mind? And then what about some strategies and opportunities? We will talk about all that more with Phil Van Dorn, who rejoins us here on Jimmy at the Crossroads. He is investing columnist and analyst at Market Watch and joins us now. Brother Phil Van Dorn, welcome back to the show, my friend. It's been a while. How are you? Doing okay, Jimmy. How are you? You know, I'm doing pretty well, given everything that's happening across the country and so forth. And uh, I'm I'm grateful for how things are going for me. You know, it could be a lot worse for sure. And uh, how how about you? Same thing. Very grateful. Um, you know, something occurred to me with that clip that you just showed, uh, the TV clip. Um, I don't remember the gentleman's name, but he made a good point. Even though he showed that it's difficult to have a back of the envelope discussion on the fly, the point was a good one. The second quarter GDP decline figure will be exaggerated because it will be annualized. So I, I agree with him in, in that respect. So you're going to have a very ugly number, uh, which could drive some ugly uh, market action when it comes out in July. Um, that said, I think uh, the stock market is showing that investors are pleased with the extraordinary efforts of Congress, the President, and the Federal Reserve to, uh, to shore up the economy. And one thing, at the very least, is that some aspects of our economy have been st relatively stable, uh, because of some, in part because of some of that support. Now, the idea of growing back very quickly, <clears throat> that's up in the air. I mean, nobody has any Agreed. real clue about how quickly <laughs> the recovery will be, Phil. If you have laid off a dozen people, you will not be hiring a dozen back instantly. You will be cautious and bring them back slowly when you see that you absolutely need to have them as your business recovers. So I agree, it will be a slow recovery. Now, Phil Van Dorn, uh, one thing to keep in mind is how investors have been looking at all of this. I mean, the past few days, we've seen the stock market on the rise today down a bit. Um, what do you think is on the minds of investors more than anything at this point? Well, money needs a home, and interest rates are very low uh, if, if you're looking at the bond market. So there are income seekers who are looking to the equity markets in various ways to wring out additional income. And we can get a little bit further into that with an example if you want. Um, but I, I think investors are thinking long term. Why else would the market have recovered so so quickly and so significantly? They they are investors are realizing that life will return to normal. There have been plagues and terrible outbreaks of viruses before, even if we haven't had a big one recently. It's happened before and life has gotten back to normal and it will do so again. That's what people are thinking. The, the thought process makes sense in that regard, but at the same time, Phil Van Doren, it is also the case that we've had the economy shut down because of government policies, and now in various cities across the nation you have untold property damage. That is significant. Uh, a lot of businesses that were ready to reopen are going to have to wait weeks, if not months, to begin that reopening process. How much do you think that could adversely impact the economy as people try to get things going again? I don't know. I don't have any numbers. Yeah. You know, we can focus on specific images from violent events, but I, I do not know the scale of the damage that has been done through the violent acts 
over the past couple of weeks. So uh, we've had those before as well. Maybe not, certainly not within living memory for most of us, but you had lots of rioting in 1968. There have been other cases of this. So I think that investors believe that the U.S. economy will shrug this off as well. Phil Van Dorn, so when, when investors are looking at the dynamics that are in play right now, is there anything you think that they're ignoring that maybe that is not top of mind? And then we'll get to a few of your stories. They might be ignoring true diversification of their holdings. I looked just today at uh, day-end numbers through, uh, through June 3rd, and at that time, five stocks made up 22% of the S&P 500. The S&P 500 is weighted to companies' market values. So all, all millions of people who put their money in index funds through retirement accounts at work are, are very heavily concentrated in Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Facebook, and um, Amazon. So they are not as diversified as they might think. So they might consider different types of investment vehicles to broaden their horizons a little bit. They also might think about certain income producing investments instead of only growth investments. And many people have financial advisors and they should open up discussions with them and try to broaden their horizons by asset classes as well as within the stock market. So, Phil, when we look at the index fund dynamic that you're talking about, I mean, there are different ways where people can invest in a whole bunch of stocks as opposed to just picking an individual company, you know, Apple, Netflix, whatever it is, and investing in that way. Uh, and, and some have expressed concern about that, going to your diversification point, concerned that too many investors are putting their eggs in one basket or too few baskets, that maybe they think they're diversified because they're in one of these funds or an exchange-traded fund, for example, but maybe they may not be as protected against some of these volatile dynamics that are in play as they should be. What do you think? Age of a young investor with many decades to go will should be less concerned about volatility than an older investor who may have to start drawing income from his or her nest egg within a few years. That's part of it. Your own risk tolerance is part of it. But depending on whether this money is in a retirement account or not, why not consider other things? You can consider. Um, what about owning a rental property, for example? Then you're no longer tied to the stock market and money is coming in every month, assuming that your renters are able to pay. Um, there, within the stock market, I've been looking at some closed end mutual funds which are designed to provide income. They can be complicated, but depending on the fund, you might get a yield of over 6% at this time, which is quite significant when you consider a 10-year treasury bond pays you around 0.7%. There are also um, closed-end bond funds that mature, that mature within only one or two years, meaning the fund ends within that time. You can buy those at a discount, enjoy an above-market yield, and have that yield and the gain because of the current discount when it matures in a short period of time. With, with those investments, you might be looking at 7 or 8% annual returns with almost no risk, at least compared to the stock market. So I just think it's a good idea to consider broadening your horizons. See what's out there. And if you need help, talk to an advisor, hopefully one whose fees aren't too high, and um, broaden your horizons. So let's talk about the T. Rowe Price Capital Appreciation Fund, one of your stories of the last handful of days, Phil. It looks like this one guy has uh, got, a, uh, got a, a fund that's performing pretty well. This was something of a human interest story. Uh, one of my readers pointed out um, the next day that the fund is closed. So you can't even put money into the fund unless you're already a shareholder. Uh -huh. That means that I failed in my research before we published the story. Phil. But it also... <laughs> it had Come a human on, interest angle. We, uh, the, the fund manager narrated what it was like to go through the stock market crash in February and March and how he put $9 billion to work during that time. So he, he mentioned 16 stocks he either bought or added to 
to to in the tunes of hundreds of millions of dollars uh, on a day by day basis as the crash occurred. So I think it's a fascinating story. It's called uh, "What It's Like to Buy Nine Billion in Stocks During a Market Crash." I would check it out. It is fascinating. It's easy for him to be buying when everybody else is selling, but he admitted that he had trouble sleeping at night. So uh, I I, th I think the, that your listeners may find this story interesting. Yeah. So in other words, it's it's an example of how somebody was able to take a bad situation and get through it pretty well. It helps that he's managing fifty seven billion dollars. Only and a that, little bit. And that he was sitting on a mountain of cash <laughs> at the end of last year. He thought the stock market was valued too high. So he just happened to have all this cash on hand. But he said that's the way he runs this fund. It tends to take advantage of down markets and load up at that time and be much more conservatively run when the market is higher. So it's just something to look at because it, it can also help you broaden your thinking as an investor. Again, we're talking with Phil Van Doren, investing columnist and analyst at Market Watch, joining us here on Jimmy at the Crossroads. So you also have a story about John Bartlett. He's with the Reeves Utility Income Fund. And one thing that I always like about your this, a lot of the stories that you focus on is there are different strategies that investors put into place in order to be effective at making money, and whether it's an income-focused opportunity or they're trying to navigate uh, difficult waters like we've got over the past few months economically and what have you. So what is this, this fund doing? Well, first of all, this fund doesn't try to navigate the economic waters. It's very specifically focused on providing monthly income to its shareholders. And it does so by investing in utility companies, which they define very broadly. It's not only electric and gas utilities, it's communications companies such as uh, Verizon as well. These, but he, he, the manager, uh, Mr. Bartlett, focuses on companies that are building out their infrastructure. For example, where I live in Florida, Flower, Florida Power and Light is vastly expanding its electric grid and improving the electric grid so that it can um, recover more quickly after power outages from thunderstorms, hurricanes, and tropical storms. He explained, and it's in the article, how those investments lead to higher profits for regulated utilities because the regulators are involved in the investment decisions and in effect come close to guaranteeing that earnings will increase as the investments are made. So it's very, very industry specific. And backtracking to the closed end fund industry, this fund has a yield of around 6.5%. Uh, actually, it went down to 6% because the stock went up over the last few days. So it has a yield of around 6%, which is very attractive. There are other closed-end funds out there which may be paying 10% or more, but you have to be careful. There are esoteric details in this class of investment that you must learn before jumping in. We, You and I can get into more detail if you want, but... Um, Listeners can read the story. Um, it's called This Unusual Income Fund, has a dividend yield of 6.5%, and has beaten the S&P 500. This fund beat the S&P 500 for 5, 10, and 15 years, which is incredible for an income fund. The reason is the managers are going for capital gains each year, which are distributed as part of the dividend. They harvest those gains at the beginning of the year so that they're ready to pay out the monthly dividend all year long. So it's good for income investors and for long-term growth investors, or at least it has been over the last 15 years. Let's explore for a moment this idea about not how this fund and others, there are other funds out there that don't try to navigate the, shall we say, choppy economic waters, that they're not uh, making day-by-day -day decisions, that are making these kinds of adjustments. That kind of goes to a question that we've often talked about here on the show with you, Phil, and that is about following the headlines or ignoring the headlines. Um, talk to us a little bit about how some of these funds, of course, you, you just talk about one's approach, but how other funds may look at the idea of trying to navigate economic waters versus let's just keep steady with a very particular plan. This is what we do. This is how we're going to continue to go about it. How common is this idea of, a, shall we say, just the steady path versus we need to make adjustments? Well, there are many, many uh, even passively managed funds that follow a steady path. For example, uh, today we covered the uh, uh, the ticker is S O X X. So that's S is in Sam O X Ray X Ray. That's the iShares 
semiconductor ETF. It tracks an index of 30 companies that make computer chips or the equipment used to manufacture them. It is much more volatile than the S&P 500, but it has um, tripled the performance of the S&P 500 over the past five years. So you are going to go through much more painful declines with this group, and it will not be adjusted based on what's going on in the economy. But the rewards have been there because people keep buying more and more devices that need the chips. So it's a group that's constantly innovating. As a group, sales grow faster than they do for the entire stock market. So over the long or over various long-term periods, it keeps beating the S&P 500. So that's a, a passive approach you can look at. Then again, semiconductors are used in many different industries. There are, there are much more narrowly focused ETFs that only focus on one industry. I looked at one yesterday, JETS, J-E-T-S is the uh, ticker. It tracks airline stocks. As you could imagine, it's, it's had some blowout days recently. If you're a day trader, and you think that the economic news is going to keep improving, you might be looking at ETFs of that type. It's up 9% only today. Shares of American Airlines were up 25% only today, last time I looked. So whatever kind of investor you are, there are vehicles for it. I, don't, I am not a day trader, and um, I'm not well-versed in that style. But Jets is a typical uh, example of how you can place tremendous bets that can – enable you to make a quick killing or lose your shirt. Let's talk about different sectors and how they've been performing just for a moment. Anything catching your eye as, I mean, you mentioned airlines for a moment. We've been seeing them struggle the past few months, understandably so, when people have not really been able to travel. So very few have been on airplanes. Unusual for um, the United States, very unusual. I don't think we've seen anything like it except since 2001, that time period with September 11th. But any other sectors that are sort of catching your attention? Well, you know, everything is up tremendously since um, since the market bottomed on uh, March 23rd. As we speak, I'm trying to pull the figures for the uh, airline industry, just for the heck of it, um, and and the cruise industry. Um, that one, I, I I forgot about the cruise. Yeah, absolutely, the cruise industry. It's interesting because that was a hotbed for the spread of this virus in the beginning, in the early days, with the the Princess cruise ship and so forth. One can argue that the airlines are a more important industry mm -hmm. because oh, well, you sure. will be compelled to visit your loved ones, but you're not compelled to go on a Petri dish cruise. That's um, true. Yes. So s since the bottom, um, the, uh, the hotel resort and cruise line group of S and P 500 companies is up 53% and the airlines are up 34%. So I sit corrected. Uh, the, <laughs> then again, the cruise lines may have gone down a bit more than the airlines before that. Um, looks like they did they they crashed they crashed more anyway what look it depends how we look at this if we look since the bottom energy is the best up 72 percent because they had the double whammy of the uh the oil price war you know the massive uh, production increase when demand was subsiding okay. materials follows suit that's up 51 percent since the bottom Everything's up tremendously since the bottom, but uh, consumer staples is up the least, 22%, and then energy tops. Uh, as far as what sticks out to me, healthcare always sticks out to me because we all need it. And the population around the whole world is aging. So I, it, it, again, it depends on the time period. Now, also, of course, tech has gotten a lot of intrigue and interest in recent years, but especially in the past few months, if people have turned to, and tech-related sectors. So when I say that, I mean, sure, Apple and Microsoft, for example, but also uh, Netflix and, and some of those kinds of companies. What are we noticing going on in that space, especially because any, anything, anything you've noticed in that regard? Well, you always have high-flying stocks based on fads. Now, not, I'm not saying fad in a bad way, but Zoom. Yes. Is incredibly popular now. So it's not a fad. It's a trend. And that one has popped. And I can't tell you if it's overvalued right now. I'd have to take a very close look at the numbers. So you always have something like that. The next good thing or something new that does a better job of, of, uh, of providing a service that others were already providing. I've spoken to people using Zoom who say it works better than Skype. 
they say it's easier to maintain the quality of the video and there there are less dropped video calls so they love it so zoom is a is a success but i pointed out the semiconductors because our increased use of streaming cloud computing collaboration over the web video conferences all that stuff requires the use of uh, computer chips and so chip I, stocks, I like the broad exposure. <laughs> so talk to us then about chip stocks. Seems they're flying pretty high, although investors still finding some bargains. Yes. So uh, that's why I, I mentioned that one. Um, we have the greater volatility. At any time, the chip stocks look expensive. At almost any time, they look expensive when compared to the entire S&P 500 based on how high the stocks are, flow are going. But also the price to earnings ratios sometimes look very, very low as they typically do for a company such as Micron. But, but anyway, I like the SOX 2Xs ETF as a way to play 30 chip makers at the same time. And if you can tolerate the volatility, it's been a wonderful long-term investment. Looking within those 30, um, analysts' favorites include um, Micron, which I mentioned, Applied Materials, uh, Qualcomm. They expect plenty of upside for these stocks over the next 12 months from here, despite the recovery for the sector and the broad market since the March 23rd low. Phil Van Doren, again, our guest, investing columnist and analyst at MarketWatch. So uh, I'm pleased to have you on today to be able to go over some opportunities, especially as people are, I think, feeling a little bit more comfortable about the economy and where it's headed, especially because of, of the reopening. But at the same time, I want to ask you the question. I alluded to it before. I ask you every time you come on just because you always give a slightly different answer. And But at the same time, it's the same fundamental point. What do you tell people who are looking closely at the headlines and following headlines when making decisions sometimes as opposed to maybe ignoring the headlines on a on a regular basis and making investing decisions well let me uh, skirt around your question a little bit and tell you I spoke to um, in, in my business we talk to public relations representatives all the time mm -hmm. and I spoke to a young one who helped me with an article and she said I've I've saved up some cash and I want to I want to open a brokerage account and start investing what stocks should I buy so I started by telling her I have no idea what stocks you should buy but as we spoke I realized that the the most important message was her, for her was to focus on controlling your expenses because if you can get your expenses in line and balance out your financial life and start saving cash when you get started, your savings will grow faster than any investment that you can make. So advice number one is control your expenses. Number two is start saving cash for the things that you need that you know are coming up and to make investments slowly and steadily over a long period of time. Make broad investor investments if you are a novice investor. If you are a professional investor, you don't need my help. If you are a day trader, what does that mean? Have you just started day trading? Then you better start small because you need experience in order to understand when, when to add and when to sell. When to take your lumps and sell at a loss. How not to sell too early how not to wait too long before selling at a profit. All that stuff requires, an ex requires experience. So I worry about novice investors, and I, I want them to learn what they're doing before they lose their shirts. And for long-term investors, diversify. Do your own research if you're buying individual stocks. Learn to have faith in the company you're investing in, or don't buy that stock. And then if you have the faith, keep the faith for a number of years. So heed that advice and do not just make rash decisions based off of the headlines. I'm going to throw that answer into the question as well. Phil Van Dorn. You did a better job than I did. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, no, the, you gave Thanks, some great, great insights there. Always good to talk with you, my friend, Phil Van Dorn. Thank you. All the best. Best wishes and stay healthy. Thanks. Thank you, you too. Bye-bye. Again, Phil Van Dorn is investing columnist and analyst at MarketWatch, joining us here on Jimmy at the Crossroads. You know, a little bit of a divergence. We haven't talked too much about nitty-gritty of sort of stock market and investing and some of the dynamics that are happening right now. There are opportunities. The economy is improving. Jobs numbers, 
not as bad maybe as we were expecting, maybe things will start picking up. We will have to see. In the meantime, I hope you will tune in tomorrow for Dinesh D'Souza on Free to Choose Friday. Looking forward to having a noted documentarian, done some great conservative documentaries. He's written a lot of books. He's got a new one on socialism. That's the theme of our Free to Choose Friday tomorrow is socialism, and especially socialism in young people. He'll be our keynote, working on a couple of other great guests as well. So be sure to tune in then. If you have not done so, please subscribe to the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jimmy at the Crossroads. Check out the website, Jimmy at the Crossroads.com. And of course, our partners at WashingtonExaminer.com. That is it for us today. My thanks again to Phil Van Dorn from Market Watch for joining us here on Jimmy at the Crossroads, as well as Nathan Matouche, producer extraordinaire, working the Matouche magic day in and day out. We've got some exciting stuff coming up in the coming days on the program, so do not miss a beat. And please share. Please share the channel as well from YouTube to your friends, your family, anybody you know who might like engaging, intelligent talk, saying style. Stay well, stay healthy, stay safe, and as always, may God bless America.